We have uh, one of our favorites, uh, uh, a longtime friend of mine uh, who has served in the United States House of Representatives. Uh, before that, he was in the State House, and uh, his name is Scott Perry. Do you know Scott Perry? He served three terms as a Pennsylvania State Rep. He, he established a record for protecting taxpayers' interests in Harrisburg. He earned the privilege of serving as a congressman from Pennsylvania's 4th Congressional District in 2013. He earned re-election to the newly redistricted 10th District in 2018 and presently serves as the U.S. House Committees on the U.S. House Committees on Transportation and Infrastructure and Foreign Affairs. Scott Perry knows the importance of hard work and dedication. He's the grandson of Colombian immig immigrants and the son of a single mom who fled two abusive um, um, situations and worked several jobs to survive and support her kids. Uh, and he, 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 this, is, this guy is a guy who represents the heart of Pennsylvanians. Uh, he's been a longtime friend of mine, and uh, I want you to welcome him warmly, Congressman Scott Perry. <laughs> PLC, awesome, awesome, awesome to be with you. So awesome. Thank you. Joe Watkins, one of my heroes, talking about my mom, the original hero. So I thought about what I might talk to you. OK, I see what the timer is there. That's good. What I might talk to you about today. And you, know, you guys know I spent some time in, in the Army in uniform, so I thought, well, when you're briefing in the military, we call it a five-paragraph operations order. And if you're not familiar with that, the circumstance is this. Whether you're the commanding general, whether you're a lieutenant doing a briefing, or whether you're the private that's running the projector that's putting the... Good to see you guys out there. Northern Dauphin County in the house. Putting the slides up on the screen there. Everybody has to know the mission, right? Everybody has to know the mission. And the reason... For, you know, the prime example... Nobody probably knows the name John Reynolds. Anybody here know the name Major General John Reynolds? Just a couple of you, right? Because he was killed on the first day in the Battle of Gettysburg. Killed on the first day. But every soldier on the battlefield needs to know what the mission is so that he can complete the mission. So the five-paragraph op order starts out with the situation. Situation, mission, execution, service support. I think it's called sustainment and support command and signal. The situation. So you come in, general comes in for the briefing, sits down. What's the situation? That's, our, that's where we are right now. We start out with the enemy situation and then go to the friendly situation. So let's start out with the enemy situation. I was thinking about that a little bit last night, kind of going through my mind about our situation. My mind wandered to our foreign adversaries first. Because that should be the enemy situation, right? You got Russia, you got Iran, you got North Korea, you got China. The enemy situation. Something that Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives, Americans should all agree on. Now, we don't, believe it or not, and I know you know that. But it's amazing to me that I wanted to put it in that context, but I knew that wasn't going to be enough for you. It's not enough for our audience my audience here this morning, because we have another enemy, right? Of course, Iran is trying to destroy the United States of America. Of course, Russia is trying to destroy the United States of America. Of course, China using unrestricted warfare. That's kind of obvious. But there is another enemy, unfortunately, in the wire, as we call it, right? They're the enemy outside the wire. We're in the wire. We've got this protection around us. We get guards and sentries up and and listening posts and observation posts and all that stuff, but we got, unfortunately, an enemy inside the wire. The enemy outside the wire you can get. You know where they're coming from. You can expect what they're going to do. You can probably counter it. There's nobody better in that when we want to than the United States of America. However, not necessarily prepared, and in my mind, not managing well the enemy inside the wire. So I want to talk to you about that a little bit today. The enemy inside the wire is doing things to America, to you, to your family that have never been seen before in America. And every day you wake up, you think, that's got to be the limit of advance of the enemy. I can't imagine they're going to do any more. And every single day they surprise us. You, go, you look at our border. 
That's one of the biggest things. That's an 80% issue, by the way. Republicans, Democrats, independents, an 80% issue. Unbridled, it's, it's not even that we, that we allow them to come across the border. We just saw the Texas National Guard overrun by people coming through the border, coming across the border, running to Border Patrol. I'm not here to disparage Border Patrol, but the President of the United States and the Secretary of Homeland Security has ordered the Border Patrol to process these individuals, not to say, hold on a second, you don't belong here, I'm gonna turn you around and head you back to where you came from. That's not their mission anymore. Their mission is to process them. This is happening, and if that's not bad enough, if it's not bad enough, literally flying people. We don't, even, we don't even have them bother to come across the border and walk across the border. We're now flying them into the country, courtesy of the United States. That's all going on. I don't know if you've been to the grocery store lately. I imagine you have. If you eat, you gotta go to the grocery store or somebody does. You can't blame the grocery store owner. You can't blame the restaurant owner. You can't afford your dinner. You can't afford food. You can't afford your credit card bills. You can't afford your car payments. Heaven forbid you, you have to buy a new house or another house. You can't afford anything in America today because of what this federal government is doing to you. And oh, by the way, if you thought you would speak your mind, thought you'd go to school board meeting because, I don't know, you've got a daughter that wants to be in school and wants to go to the locker room because she plays some sport and she wants to be able to change in there, and she has this sense of privacy for herself when she goes to the locker room or the bathroom, and then that is shattered when she sees somebody of the opposite sex there, right? That is, that's, that's our community today. And if you say something about it, right, First Amendment, if you say something about it, the FBI potentially, likely, will list you, put a red flag on you, and list you as a domestic extremist happening in your country today. All kinds of things. Let's talk about your energy, your energy bills. If you're paying, you know, we had a light winter. Let's face it, in Pennsylvania, we had a light winter. But your energy bills, if they were like mine, are still fairly high, almost unaffordable for a lot of people. All by design, all by design. And you think to yourself, I live in America, I can make my choices. I, I choose to buy and drive a, a, an expedition. I'm like a you know, suburban, whatever. I don't know what the big Dodge is. We'll, we'll pick American car manufacturers. But that was your choice. You always thought it would be your choice. But car manufacturers are making cars not based on what consumers, not based on what you want, but based on what the government tells them they're allowed to make. And now they're telling us that in a couple years, literally, well, a few years, you're gonna have a, less of a choice. You're gonna to have to buy an electric vehicle supplied by China, chips in it by China, our enemy, by the way. Not because America wants to be China's enemy, but because China calls us their enemy. And that's not gonna be your choice anymore. And oh, by the way, if you want a gas stove, I know they've relaxed at this moment. This administration has relaxed because there's this hue and cry. I asked them about it in a hearing. They said, they said well, we're not trying to ban all gas stoves. We're not, that's not the intent, not to ban all gas stoves. But the rule, not legislation, the rule, the rule makers, the administration would make 95% of gas stoves unsellable. Current gas stoves, you wouldn't be able to buy 95% of them. So effectively, they are banning, or they, they, they seek to ban the gas stove. This is your country where you look at the Constitution and you say, where does the federal government have any business what stove I buy, what car I drive, or who's in the bathroom with my daughter, right? And that is what we're facing today, which is why it's important to understand the friendly and the enemy. So that's the enemy situation. Let's talk about the friendly situation. The friendly situation is this, especially as members of Congress, we have really one or two tools to rein in an out of control federal government. One tool, impeachment. It is not a legal remedy. It is not a criminal legal remedy. It is a political remedy. If you get the votes, somebody's done something wrong, the American people agree with you, you're impeached. Senate still has to convict, that's one remedy. 
The other remedy, the most important remedy, is the power of the money. Because all the things that we talked about, whether it's energy, whether it's the bathroom, whether it's uh, your, your, your vehicle that you're, you're going to buy or not going to buy, any single thing that the federal government does takes money. And that comes from the United States Congress. But if your members, if the elected members are unwilling to do anything about it, they're just going to keep going. And this is the friendly situation. So a year and a half ago, two years ago, Nancy Pelosi was the speaker. We didn't get our appropriations done because we never do, because nobody wants to. Nobody wants to do that because that would be accountability. You would be able to see this is the person that voted for this, and this is what it is, and I don't agree with that, so I'm not voting. They don't want you to see that, right? So they pile it all together right before Christmas in a thing called an omnibus. And every single Republican in the House voted against it. Trillions of dollars in spending. Meanwhile, we're going to be at 34, 35 trillion. We're at 34 and a half or so now. We're going to be at 35 trillion in debt next month, in May. It's April. Every single Republican in the House voted against it. All the policies in there of the Biden administration, every single thing that you hate that's a prevailing on your life and imposing on your life, shepherded right through without a Republican vote. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, we just voted for 30 billion more and all the same policies, which is why you need to know what the friendly situation is. Because ladies and gentlemen, who you send to represent you makes a difference, makes a difference. Just think of it in those terms, all right? And then, so you go from, this is a situation. You got the enemy, you got the friendly. What's the mission? Ladies and gentlemen, this mission is to save this republic. At least that's the mission I'm on. I think that's the mission that you're on. That is our mission. It's not to go to Harrisburg or Washington, D.C. and get a nice meal and have, you know, trips to wherever and have great relationships with your colleagues. That's all nice. It's irrelevant. It is irrelevant, and too many people, I think, they go to these places, Washington or Harrisburg, I've been to both, and they lose focus on what they're doing there. And that's how you get Republicans voting for 30 billion more in spending than they all voted against, against Nancy Pelosi. Somehow it was better under Joe Biden, and quite honestly, our speaker. It's important that we get the right people. So we are in the season of our primaries. Now, this is a family, this is a family discussion. Sometimes it's a family argument, right? We have different selection of candidates. You gotta pick the, the most conservative one that will win. Not the one that's just gonna tell you they're gonna do it. And it's hard to, I know, it's hard to determine sometimes. But I will tell you this, if they've got votes, if they're moving from the state house or the state senate to Congress and they've got votes, none of the talking matters. Show me the votes, because people will tell you anything. It's how they vote that's going to make a difference, and nothing else will. You have to be discerning. Now, I will just tell you this. I did not pick, just like John Reynolds, I didn't pick the battlefield that I was going to have to fight on, and neither do you. It is what it is. We have what we have. I don't like 50 days of voting in Pennsylvania, ladies and gentlemen. Here's me, here's Scott Perry. I'm gonna show up on, on election day, like the Constitution says. Not election month or election week, I'm gonna show up on election day, I'm gonna bring my identification. I'm gonna cast my ballot as a citizen of the United States, a person who's bona fide, with a legitimate right to make decisions and have a vote and have a voice on behalf of the country that I live in. That's me. That would be Scott Perry's rule, law, if Scott Perry were somehow the supreme allied commander or something. But I'm not, and neither are you. So the situation is we have 50 days of voting, and if you look at the voter rolls, Pennsylvania, a little dicey state, some districts a little better than others, some not, I would just tell you this. If every single Republican that's on the registration rolls that registered as a Republican voted, not voted on election day, not voted early, just voted. We would win every single election. Our problem is, is that our Republican friends don't vote. So I'm not telling you, look, we all know. I will tell you, I know them personally. I found out last November. I knew people that just a day or two before didn't go to the polls and vote. And that's a failure on my part, and it's a failure on our part. If we want to win, I didn't set up the rules of the battle. 
Reynolds ran into the Confederate Army who was heading into Gettysburg to find some shoes, and he got shot in the neck, and he died. He didn't pick the battlefield. This is what we have, ladies and gentlemen. We can all talk to five, ten people. They all say they're going to vote, probably if you know them, because they know you're going to ask. They all say they're going to vote. I, I, you know, look, I'm just going to tell you the reality is, is that some of them are not. We're going to have to get right with using these mail-in ballots for the people that can't get there on Election Day for whatever reason. And I will tell you this. People are saying, well, we need the legislature to change this situation so we don't have this, so we can go back to the way it was. Ladies and gentlemen, the battlefield is here. It's now. It's today. It's coming. We don't have time for that, and that's probably not going to happen anyhow. The way it's going to happen is this. We're going to take the, the system that they have, the system that was put in place, and we're going to beat them at their own game. And when we beat them at their own game, they'll be crying to show up on election day with their identification. Stay in the fight. Be committed to it. Don't trust that your friends and colleagues and your family are going to go vote. Make sure, make sure they get an application. Make sure you're with them when they fill it out. Make sure it gets to voter election and registration. Make sure they vote. God bless you. Stay in the fight.